Welcome back everyone and everything to Game Breakdown, and let's jump right on into breaking down Sly 2's first proper episode, The Black Chateau. Go Murray, put on those gloves! Yeah, Bentley, service that crossbow! Yeah, Sly, raise that cane that you're literally never without. Great prep work. Okay, things are gonna go a little differently this time around. Last time we covered a single mission, and while it was definitely a beefy mission, this time we're covering the entirety of the Paris level, which has about 10 missions. So honestly, it's anyone's guess how exactly this is gonna go, so just bear with me. But we're off to a strong start with another animated cutscene. From here on in, these are gonna act as bookends to the chapters, ensuring they all start and finish strong. <laughs> I had to call in a few favors to get the goods on the Claw Gang's local operator. Dimitri, a sort of underworld celebrity, equally at home in high-class art circles and shady back-alley crimes. He was once a passionate young art student who worked hard to develop his own visionary style. Unfortunately, the art world wasn't quite ready for his kinetic aesthetic. So he gave them what they wanted, and started forging old masterpieces. His way of punishing those with bad taste. Our villain de episode, Dimitri, is a fan favorite, and for good reason. His design is off to a great start with a strong visual pun, being a lounge lizard. And look at this artwork, it's got real meme potential I tell ya, this is gonna take off. Okay, so the artwork he forges, obviously we've got the Mona Lisa and the Birth of Venus, well, sorta. And then what's even this middle one? Well, it's slightly more obscure, but this is The Kiss, painted by Gustav Klimt. God, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Oh, and you can bet we're gonna obsess about these little bits of art for a second, because they're a really cool bit of world building. Of course, everyone in Sly's world is an anthropomorphic animal. There's no people, so even the people in these pictures are animals. Though it is a little weird that they all appear to be the same species as Dimitri, even before he adds his own personal touches. Is every artist and subject in this world a lizard? Dimitri now runs a nightclub on the west side. The thumping music, colorful light shows, and a hint of danger lure in chic young patrons from far and wide. And it's here, hidden somewhere, where we'll find the clockwork tail feathers. What Dimitri plans to do with the clockwork part is beyond me. But those plans end tonight. Nah, I think you guys were closer when you had the music synced up with you. This is just poor prep work. Alright, and the title, The Black Chateau. This has always struck me as unfitting. Chateau is French for castle, and yeah, the nightclub is a bit of a stronghold, and black is probably meant in the sense of it being corrupt, but I feel like they could have come up with something, I don't know, pithier? But I did do some searching, and if you translate the whole thing to French, you get Le Chateau Noir, which is the name of another famous painting, this time by Paul Cezanne, which I know I pronounced right. Now, I probably don't need to tell you that I'm no art major, because just a few seconds ago I said the kiss was an obscure painting, so I honestly don't know what else Le Chateau Noir could have to do with this level thematically. Like, is it a painting that's been famously forged? I don't know. But I feel like I did my due diligence here, so let's carry on. Oh, but not to proper gameplay. No, of course not. Instead, we're gonna look at the original original version of this cutscene that was shown to the public at E3 2004, several months before the original release. We have some demo footage of the last cutscene we looked at too, but there really isn't anything too different in that one from the final product. Except for Neela, oh my god. But here though, oof, you can tell it's early days. Things were happening fast. Our first target, Dimitri, a shady underworld celebrity who straddled the worlds of both high-class art and low-life nightclub. The dialogue is more or less the same, apart from it obviously being not voiced by Kevin Miller, but the cool part is seeing the overall different visual style. It's more in line with the cutscenes from the first game, super bright and colorful backgrounds, competing for attention with the focal subjects in each frame. Definitely much less of a treat for the eyes. Okay, now we can actually play the game a bit. One of the game's central marketing points was of course the ability to play as any of the three boys we got sitting around the table here. But you start off, and no matter what you do, there's no selecting either Murray or Bentley. It's either Sly, or logging onto Bentley's computer to see all the the power-ups you can't afford. Sly it is, at least for now. I tell you, Bentley, it's gonna be a real pleasure robbing this nightclub. I share in your enthusiasm, but before we hit the inside, we'll need to do a little reconnaissance work. What do you have in mind? I've installed this special antenna on the safe house to help with our first job, hacking into Dimitri's satellite array. 
The coordinates for the job start beacon have been uploaded to your binocucum. Make your way to this position, and I'll give you a full briefing on our objective. I'm on my way. The training wheels have really come off since Egypt. You have absolutely free reign over this entire area, and while we have an objective in mind, there's nothing to stop you from exploring a bit first. Navigating this space is totally freeform. The devs used the term jungle gym to describe the feel of it, and that's completely apt. Playing as Sly in these spaces is all about improvising your way from one place to another, making snap decisions about what means of traversal to use, where to cross between rooftops, and how to avoid the patrolling guards. Or not. I need you to hack into Dimitri's communication array so that we'll have access to his database. How am I supposed to do that? To start, you'll need to get to the top of that tower. Then reposition the satellite dish to point at my safe house antenna. I'm on it. Extremely smart of them to have the first mission in this more open area be all about navigation and wayfinding. It gives you a familiarity with the geography and helps you get to grips with Sly from more of a platforming perspective. But better yet, this is a great time to start looking for this game's main collectibles. Bottles. There are 30 of them in each level, and these are so gratifying. I love the soft little noise they make when you're nearby. They're a great counterbalance to the game's relatively hand-holdy waypoint system, challenging the player to explore on their own terms and build their environmental awareness. Also, I'm going to show where all 30 of them are right now, because at this point the streets have the fewest and weakest kinds of guards, so focus up, we're going to go through them literally as fast as I can. Starting from the water tower, pass this lower path to this boat, then from this patio there's one on each balcony, and you can sidle along this wall to reach one on this third balcony, then one down below that ledge, then from this building here, drop down towards the back, then back up. There's one on this bridgy sort of arch thing, then back towards the water, there's one on this boat, and we can go ahead and operate the second satellite right here. Okay, only one more to go! Another one right next to us there, then another one next to this table by the ramp. Let's cross back over to the safe house and onto this low building on the other side. Then from this high point to this balcony, cross the theater courtyard and onto the top of this building and drop onto the back side of it for another boat bottle. Cross this little bridge to the hotel, which by the way is called Le Sneaky Touris, I love that, and we can finish up our satellite mission. I'm downloading from Dimitri's mainframe as we speak. All in a night's work. So, where do we go from here? Your next job is to break into the nightclub and take some reconnaissance photos of the clockwork tail feathers. To get inside, you'll have to sneak through an old wine cellar beneath town. Okay. I'll head out for the cellar. Then there's one on the bridge between us and the purple dome, one on top of the purple dome, and one on the bridge between those two adjacent buildings. Cross from this one to another balcony, then drop from there to sidle along to this bottle by the theater sign. Another great name the game doesn't call attention to, but this theater is called Formidable, which does literally translate to formidable, but it's more of an idiom in French, used to say like, wow, or brilliant. Now let's head back towards the purple dome, cross to the theater wall from this building, and jump over to this dining area where there's another. Now down to the streets and in this tunnel, then back up this building apparently called Listing cheese, hopefully that's some sort of fondue restaurant, and get this one on the bridge towards the purple dome. One more boat bottle behind us, and we can completely ignore our next mission till we get the rest. Head back towards the clock tower to get another one behind it, then up across this skinny bridge. That balcony actually doesn't have one, so let's drop down to this awning. Only ones left are behind this gate, so jump over using this car and find one on each balcony, one on this lighting rig, and one over the central fountain. Well, that's all the inside this place somewhere. Woo! We'll find out what those are all for later, but it's nice to have that out of the way already. Now, I suppose we should actually do our next mission. Good to see you, little buddy. I guess the way through the wine cellar is guarded by those rats. Bentley thought you might like some help clearing them out. Sounds like fun. You and me, back to back? Totally. Outnumbered, fighting impossible odds. It's perfect. All right, pal. Let's get to it. Fear the Murray! The game really eases you into combat. You could engage with these rats, or you could literally just let Murray take care of all of them. Hold on, Sly. Let me lower those bars for you. There you go! I love this tiny dig Sly sneaks past Murray about taking on most of the first game's missions alone. Looks like you're on your own from here. Eh, I'm used to it. 
Thanks for the help. Anytime, partner. Now the game's gonna teach us about stealth, with a level that feels rather a lot like those from the original game, with lasers and guards to avoid along a linear path. Alright, you know what's crazy? I'm like 99.9% .9 sure crawling under things wasn't in the first game. And the only reason that's not 100% is because it feels like such a basic thing for Sly to do. How is this in addition? Ooh hoo hoo, flashlight guards. Honestly, this might be even more ingenious than the blue sparkles. Name a stealth game and I'll bet you the enemies in it have some sort of variation on the vision cone mechanic. Basically, a literal coded representation of what they can and can't see. In a stealth game, being seen is a much bigger deal than pretty much any other genre, so clearly defining these vision cones is something a lot of games have to nail. Or else the game can feel unfair. But man, Sucker Punch really took the Occam's Razor approach, didn't they? It's dark, these guards need flashlights to see, and the light from the flashlight creates an easy to identify visual. And given the game's cartoony art style, it gets away with this. This is why these kinds of games are upheld today as standards. They may not be the most realistic, but this very gameplay first mentality makes them extremely gratifying to revisit, even 20 years on. In order to shut down those yellow lasers, you'll need to take out that guard. Oh no, the yellow lasers do damage the villains have really learned since the first game. I'm gonna keep an eye out, but I'm at least 95% sure these yellow lasers never make a return. I can't remember a single place they might have, so we'll pretend this is their siren's song. Sneak up behind him and press the triangle button to knock him into the air. Then the square button to slam and finish him off. Alright, now we've got a stealth takedown to make use of. Another staple of stealth games, but this game does something with it that I think really sets it apart. It's loud. If you get in a fight with those rats, the sneak attack won't work. It's purely a stealth move. In a room like this, all the takedown is going to do is remove one rat from the equation. But it is going to begin the combat engagement, and unless you run away, you're gonna have to get your hands dirty. Combat in this game, like traversal, feels very improvisational. You have a small handful of simple options, which make it easy to make lightning-fast decisions on your best course of action. The situation evolves as longer fights draw the attention of more guards, and the rats really aren't pushovers. They've got this retaliation attack they do every time you knock them over, so if you get too fixated on one, they punish you for it, encouraging you to spread out your damage and fight them as a unit, not one by one. Alright, now before we head into this vent, there's just some weird stuff in this room. Jump up on this ledge and you'll find that you can interact with some of the stuff up here, making your way onto these upper balconies. One is empty, but the the other has an operable door, and then a set of lasers, and a rope to cross, and at the end of it, n nothing. I have to tell you, when I first found this, I was just completely baffled. All this stuff doesn't just appear here, it had to be deliberately coded. Why is it here? How is it here? Well, to find out, I'm gonna have to shed my retro gaming shackles and embrace the mindset of a modern gamer. I'm going to have to willingly choose to play an unfinished product. The Sly 2 Alpha. So it seems, earlier in development, there was a plan to put treasures that Sly could pilfer inside many of the game's buildings. They could generally be found in hard to reach places in exchange for a load of coins after finishing the missions. It's hard to say just how late in development this idea got the axe, but it's safe to say it was pretty late, since most every place where these treasures could once have been found is still in the game, but now there's nothing to find except maybe some breakables. Definitely a bit of a shame. It could have functioned as an indoor equivalent to the bottles outside, an incentive to explore and experiment, not just blindly follow Bentley's direction. Something else we can find in the alpha is a bit of an explanation for the weird yellow laser functionality. Like the security system guy really said, oh let's hook up the laser system to this guard's vitals, so that way unless someone kills him, they'll stay online. And somehow no one saw any possible holes in that design. No, instead the guards would carry keycards that you could steal off of them to disengage the lasers. Again, these lasers basically never show up again, so I don't mind this omission as much as the art thing, but I do still think it's a weird thing to cut. Pot, the heart of Dimitri's operation. Head for those windows and take some reconnaissance photos. That's right, we're a first person shooter now. Ingenious. Dimitri's using the clockwork tail feathers as printing plates. Given their rare alloy, they'll never wear out. Unlimited forged money. So Dimitri went from forging paintings to forging money. I mean, I haven't had any first-hand experience with either of those, but do those things equate, like, at all? They're both forgery, but I'm pretty sure they're extremely different kinds. Also, if you zoom in far enough, you can see that Dimitri is exclusively forging $5 bills. And don't tell me those are euros or francs either. These are definitely liberty bucks right here. Also, please do not blow up generator. I don't know how many times we have to have this chat, but you know what? We're writing it on the damn generator. That should do it, Sly. Head back to the safe house and we'll cook up a plan of attack.
the recon photos are a grim reminder of what the modern thief is up against. Spotlights, stepped up patrols, the sum of it all renders a direct assault impossible. Hold up, Bentley. I didn't take even one of these pictures. Where'd you get these? To solve this puzzle, I'm going to need some more intelligence. First, replace this bugged painting with one Dimitri has in his office. Once in place, we should be able to listen in on his communications. Second, if you see the boss, tail him. We might learn something from studying his movements. Once we've got a proper understanding of the operation, those clockwork tail feathers are as good as ours. So now there are flashlight guards out on the streets, and the smaller guards now patrol many of the rooftops, so we have a lot less free reign of this place now. Things as simple as running will have to be considered carefully going forward. We can't even carelessly smash an antenna without making enough noise to be spotted. Oh my god, he's got dynamite! On the bright side, out here we've got the ability to take advantage of our environment, and knocking enemies off of a rooftop will usually take them out instantly. Why? I managed to outfit this forged painting with a bug. I need you to sneak into Dimitri's office and swap it with the original. Nice. So we'll be able to listen in on his conversations. Yes, I thought things might go more smoothly with an ear on the inside. Just be careful with the fine art. Take any damage and the painting's ruined. So you've probably noticed, Sly's got a health bar, and we can take a couple hits before going down. But to balance this out, the game likes putting in Sly in a lot of situations where taking damage or even just being spotted is an instant fail condition. Although Bentley did say any damage, and that's just straight up a lie. These little pebbles the guards can throw at you don't count. The schematic indicates that door is locked from the inside. That's all right. I never was one for the direct approach. Swell, because the indirect approach is way up there through that air vent. Okay, these janitors in here are completely unique to this area, and while they're no flashlight guards, they're some of the toughest foes we can take on, with a moveset completely unique from anyone outside. And I think that was done on purpose. Engaging them in combat is almost sure to get your painting broken since you don't know what to expect, even if you've been spending as much time as possible fighting guards outside. But at the same time, there's not actually any clear way around them. You've got to cross the floor here to reach this bar area, but they definitely don't leave any gaps in that route. You can try a couple approaches, sneaking carefully, picking them off one at a time, avoiding them, but hilariously, the easiest way to do this is literally just to run straight past them. What are they gonna do, chase you onto this laser grid? Yeah, I didn't think so. Dimitri, coming at you loud and clear. I've got to high five kill up to my main man working the disco. Spice sales are up, up, up. Keep on moving that spice part. And to every home slice down in the special fake money making room. That nice list of jobs there for uh, like uh, Keep posting. Okay, so the way Dimitri talks is why he's so memorable. We'll talk more about it in a bit, but just know I freaking love it. So the painting we're replacing is obviously The Scream by Edvard Munch, and while it's a cute touch that our replacement is a picture of... us, I kinda think he'd notice the swap, I'm not gonna lie. Nice work, Sly. The bug's in position. If you manage to get the original painting back to me in one piece, I can sell it through my internet connections and make us a ton of coins. Oh, also, we found the vault we hunted all those bottles for. It took some higher level math, but I believe the code to Dimitri's vault is 231. You guys are probably going to think I'm crazy, but do you guys think this combination could be a deliberate reference to the Ocarina of Time 23 is number one puzzle? I'm just saying, I seriously doubt a lot of the dev team didn't play Ocarina of Time, and it feels like a pretty distinct set of three numbers. You know what, I'll just stop talking. You've gotten the knockout dive move! About that, anyway. Instead, I'll talk about the knockout dive. As classy of a move as it is to make the first power we get out of a vault a parallel to the first move we got out of a vault in the first game, I think drawing that parallel really undersold this ability. The dive in game one was kinda, sorta, really useless. It didn't do anything a normal cane swipe couldn't have, and in this game, the aerial version of it is part of our basic moveset. But now, if we equip it, we can try it out on the rats outside, and you can see that it immediately knocks out any enemy it hits, even flashlight guards, which primes them for a stealth takedown even if they've already seen you. Nice. 
All right, as Bentley said, we can sell that painting now for a load of dosh. And nobody tell whoever's buying this, but we definitely got that painting from a known forger, so... Anyway, we can afford some stuff now. Now that we've got Dimitri's office bugged, we can listen in on him from the safe house. And there's some gems in here, I gotta say. I am not cold blooded, my friend. I am cool blooded. Can someone check that stinking fountain? It leaks out of my money. Now I need to make some more. OD. Original DJ. After completing that mission, we've essentially unlocked the mechanic of finding treasures to bring them back to the safe house. The same principle as those alpha paintings, but exclusively found outside. I'm not salty. Alright, where to next? Uh... No. No, seriously, where do I go next? I can't- I can't find the freaking waypoint wait oh. I just intercepted an email from Dimitri. He's ordered his guards to ring the boat's bell when the coast is clear. Coast is clear for what? Of that I'm uncertain. Ring the bell and follow him without being seen. Then maybe we'll find out what he's hiding. Okay, in the last episode I was going to talk about how whack it is that Carmelita didn't get some sort of splash intro like the other main characters, but I rationalized thinking it must be just for the Cooper gang. But look! They gave Dimitri one! Carmelita got ripped off, what the hell? Alright, this is where the game really shines. I know, I know, it's an Assassin's Creed trailing mission before there were Assassin's Creed trailing missions, but hear me out. This is the difference made by having enjoyable characters. Between the music and just listening to Dimitri hype himself up, you want it to keep going just to see more of the big boss here. Breathe art. Feel art. Be art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy, make art. Be art. Okay, so about Dimitri's vernacular. The coolest part about Dimitri is how he talks. English is his second language and he learned all his English from watching uh, hip-hop videos. I feel like they just had way too much fun writing him. You're talking about me, my friend? Well, I'm not seeing anyone else here, so you must be talking about me. You have a lot of leeway to stay pretty far from him without failing the job, but it's a lot more fun to see just how close you can get away with. Really sell the narrative of being a thief hanging just out of sight. But to end the mission, you don't need to be any closer than on this pole here. Mm. Uh, uh -huh. Ow! Dude, your tail! Good job tailing him, Sly. He had no idea you were watching while he typed in that secret. Looks like that door leads to the nightclub's aqua pump. Hmm. This might be useful for the ice. All right, now it's time to bring out the big guns. We get access to Murray now. Sorry, the Murray. And he and Sly are night and day. Sly is best suited to avoiding combat. He has essentially free range of his environment and especially better access to the rooftops with climbables and tightropes. But while Murray is often forced to ground level, he thrives there. He can take twice the damage and take out any of these guards with just two punches. And the first one clean knocks out the little guys. No dive power up required. Tell a lie, Murray can sneak a little bit. Maybe that's down to just how much he looks up to Sly, but honestly, he can make as much ruckus as he pleases and punch his way out of most situations Sly would have to run from. Oh shoot, yellow lasers. Uh, it doesn't count. We're still in Paris. Murray, I need you to make your way back to the aqua pump room and sabotage it. Jeez, I don't know. How am I supposed to get past these lasers? You should be able to break that power box by throwing something at it. Got it. Yeah, there we go. Murray's even got ranged options over Sly. Man's a machine. Okay. 
Okay, so this level's got the whole kitchen aesthetic going on. Fridges, ice machines, sinks, no idea why, considering this is just some sort of utility tunnel. But in the alpha, they leaned even more into it, with the main obstacle being this annoying stove fire mechanic, where the fire would keep regenerating between hits with the ice blocks. He even made this amazing fire graphic for it. Definitely a better move to teach the player how to knock out the flashlight guards from afar here. Though I gotta give the alpha credit here for teaching the player something the finished game actually didn't. That being the ability to snag guards directly out of the air without having to knock them out first. That did it, Murray! When the aqua pump out of commission, they'll be forced to root water through the old pipe tower. Those fools! They're playing right into our hands! <laughs> Okay, fellas, I've constructed a plan to get at the clockwork tail feathers, but we'll need to pull off a few more jobs to set things up for the heights. First, Sly will have to pick a few pockets in the theater so that we'll have access to the Spotlight Control Center. Once that's accomplished, we'll be able to turn off all the security around the printing press. We'll need your muscle, Murray, to take out all the exterior alarm horns. We don't want anything to alert the guards while we pull off the big job. And finally, we'll need to get into the disco tech to drop this mirror ball. Trust me, it's all part of the plan. Okay, Sly, there's the power boxes which route to the printing press area. To take care of them, I'll need you to put a splice clip in those spotlights. Sorry, Bentley, but those fans are spinning way too fast to walk on. They can be slowed down from this control panel, but you'll have to do a lot of pickpocketing to get at it. The guards are carrying special fragile keys that will be destroyed if you attack. Make sure you pickpocket their keys before you take those thugs out. All right, now we're getting into the good stuff. Pickpocketing is such a natural extension of Sly's abilities. As I've said, combat isn't his forte, and even using the stealth takedown isn't always a good idea because of the noise. Oftentimes, if your goal is just to get past a guard, you're better off leaving them alive. But now we have a third option, take the risk and rob them blind. The slightly more merciful playstyle is further encouraged by the fact that guards whose pockets you've pilfered won't drop any coins on death, but pickpocketing provides a lot more of them. Not entirely sure how that works from a logical perspective. What happened? Did some of the coins break when I hit them? Not much to talk about in terms of the alpha here, but... Okay, hear me out. In the original release of the third Ratchet & Clank game, you could press all four back buttons on the menu and access a demo for Sly 2. Even though the game was released after Sly 2, this demo is based off a slightly earlier version of the game than the final release, but a later version than the alpha I've been showing, and there's a few cool details here too. Like, Bentley mentions that these guards have red flashlights, even though they don't, and there's just a few details that haven't been fully ironed out, like this version of the health bar that doesn't have room for the ability meter, likely because power-ups still weren't implemented. Back in the final version, you can hop across these lights to find another area where a painting was intended to be, but this one is populated by these cash briefcases. But in the Ratchet and Clank demo version, I'm gonna need a better name for that, let's call it the beta version, these briefcases actually worked a bit differently, being filled with tons of coins. I wish that were still the case, because these final briefcases ain't it, chief. Check one, check two, solid. Dimitri on the mic with a shout out to all my nightclub samurai. Stand tall and feel beautiful. I hear some raccoon dude giving a static. If you all spot this cracker box, bam! Make him unhappy. Take no prisoners. Go hardcore. Extreme all over his face. Okay, be up. I love how Dimitri calls his guards his nightclub samurai. You get the sense that Dimitri's probably a super supportive boss who just wants all his boys living their best lives. All right, Sly, what's up with this one key at a time schlock? What happened to throwing seven at a time? You've lost a step, my guy. Okay, so the goal here was to slow down these fans so we could walk on them, but let's see just how often we actually have to touch the spinning part. Nice. I'm overriding the spotlight security gun. That should do it. No more security in the printing press room. Easy to miss detail here, Bentley seems to have programmed the spotlights to be our calling card. That was real subtle, Bentley. Hey Sly, you can pickpocket all the guards around the nightclub. Try to find guys carrying shiny loot in their back pockets. We can pop the good stuff for a lot of coins back here at the safe house. <laughs> 
So we're encouraged to just rob line everyone we see, and if you want to afford all the power-ups in this game, you're gonna definitely want to do that. And being fair, this wasn't in the alpha. Pickpocketing was reserved for key cards, so it's possible they thought that putting the pocket loot along with the art within the levels ended up providing too much money, but come on, we're thieves! That's gotta be the point. Am I harping on about this? I'm harping on about this, aren't I? Hold it, Koopa. Constable Neela. Another policewoman hot on my tail. Please, I led you here. So that claw gang slip was a clue. Why are you helping me out? I'm not as black and white as Carmelita. I know what a menace those clockwork parts are, and I don't want the likes of the claw gang putting them to use. So what, it takes a thief to catch a thief? Something like that. But if I'm going to trust you in this case, I need to know that you can keep up. Literally. Literally. Don't fall behind. Ooh, the wild card returns. Remember how I mentioned they showed off Carmelita's athletic abilities as a subtle nod towards her and Sly's compatibility? Well, here's Neela showing off an identical run speed to him, the ability to cross thin rails, and she even shows the same flagrant disregard for public property. This golden trail she leaves even puts me in mind of the gold horseshoe glow Sly could have on his back in the first game. Oh my god, she even shares our lifelong grudge against Antenna, be still my heart. Oh, I wouldn't be so sure about that. Well done, Sly. We should work well together. Glad you approve. Now, legally, I can't enter Dimitri's nightclub without a warrant. But I happen to have obtained a key to his back door, which a person like yourself can use however he pleases. Oh, we are absolutely going to work well together. More symbolism at play here in this literal reversal of the relationship Sly and Carmelita have. Sly now chasing after Neela as she plays the more confident role in their banter. Who is it? I, tiger lady, have been seen around in my woods. This is a good opportunity to grab the treasure in this courtyard on our way back. It'll be easier to sneak it across this back way, where we'll have a route across nearly unpopulated rooftops. I definitely want to mention this little back route did not exist in the alpha, and neither did this car. In fact, there's a whole cut mission about unlocking this gate from the inside by latching onto the treads of a helicopter and dropping off on the other side after it flies you around town trying to shake you. Yeah, it sounds cool as hell. In practice, it was a little lame. But I don't know, I feel like they could have made something fun out of this. But ultimately, I think the cut was worth it for giving the map more connectivity. I'm going to need access into Dimitri's rear- The helicopter does get an honorable mention through Dimitri, though. Maybe my helicopter, eyes in the skies, will find that big stick stick. Okay, now the third member of the crew, Bentley. Sly has the acrobatics, the agility, Murray's got the power, what does Bentley have? Well, he, um... He's just as frail as Sly, and hits with even less oomph, but, but, to counterbalance that, he can't do most of the climbing and sneaking either. And what he can do, sidle along walls and crawl under tables, he does at half of Sly's speed. So, uh, yay. Alright, I'm not being fair. Bentley is the gadget specialist of the team, armed with sleep darts and explosives, enabling him to put guards down from afar, and cause destruction from close by. This makes him more effective in combat than even Murray given the right conditions, but it makes playing as him feel fraught and tense, as none of his tools are effective if he's caught by surprise. Hammered home by Matt Olson's brilliant performance. Hey Bentley, how you holding up out there in the field? Fine. Fine, I'm just fine. I just need to bob all the pillars supporting that disco ball and I can get out of here. What's with taking out the disco ball? Its impact will shake the nightclub's front peacock side loose from its morning. Look, I can't talk now, I've got to keep moving, keep safe! Before blowing this place to kingdom come, I want to take a moment to appreciate the details in here. I love this partially submerged window, Dimitri's office looking over the whole thing, these ridiculous egg tables, the subtle joke that you never once have to step on the dance floor but it's covered in lasers, forcing you to dance around them if you come down. If you come back as Sly, you can also reach these upper areas for, you guessed it, some alpha treasure paintings, but honestly I'm not even upset about it this time. I think this area is really cool on its own merits, and it would take someone with way too much time on their hands to find it in the first place, so gold stars all around. Okay, except, who the heck is that? That's just straight up a guy. I mean, who even? First guess, maybe it's Peter McConnell, Sly 2's composer, but oh, definitely not. Next guest, maybe Yashif Hakik, Sly 1's composer, and, uh, well, he's got a guitar at least. Yeah, okay, I got nothing. My only other guess is that it's an inside joke with the company, and this is the same guy they put on the hot dog in the first game. Bentley, we 
felt that all the way back here at the safe house. And you were right. The peacock sign had half of its bolts pop off on impact. All right, now for Murray's next mission. Okay, Murray. That alarm horn will tip off Dimitri during our heist. There are three of them out here, and I need you to take them out. Check. This is going to take some serious muscle, Murray. You're the only guy on the team who can pull this off. Good luck, pal. This could get rough. Evildoers feel my wrath. In the alpha, we got lots of early voice lines spoken by a lot of people who are not the voice actors. It's super cursed. Relax, Bentley. I'll just make a little noise to lure this dependable guard off his post and then sneak behind him while he's distracted. That's all right. I never was one for the direct approach. Hey, Bentley, you don't have to talk to me like I'm a child. Well, I'm, I'm just trying to make it crystal clear for you. What's clear to me is that you're not sure I can pull this off. Look, look, if I'm the guy for the job, then I'm the guy. Don't worry, I'll take care of these alarm things for you. But in the beta, we've actually got Chris Murphy reading this line. Hey, Bentley, you don't have to talk to me like I'm a child. Well, I'm just trying to make it crystal clear for you. What's clear to me is that you're not sure I can pull this off. Look, if I'm the guy for the job, then I'm the guy. Don't worry. The Murray will lay waste to these alarms and emerge triumphant. I almost like this one better. I just like hearing the characters amp themselves up, but it's probably better we got the version where Bentley shows more confidence in his partner. When playing as Murray, if you do use the triangle circle grab combo, pretty much everything is way easier. Though I want to point out that the guards in the alpha could take a lot more punishment. Okay, fellas, the dominoes are all in place. Time to pull off the big heist. First, Murray will help me break into the old water tower. From there, I should be able to shut down the plaza fountain. Dimitri's sure to send someone out to get the repair truck. Slot, you'll pickpocket the truck keys off this guy once he shows up, then hand them off to me and Murray in the plaza. We'll go steal the truck while you climb to the top of the nightclub's peacock sign. When you're in position, Murray will fire the truck's winch line up to you and will use it to pull down the sign. If my calculations are correct, the impact should create an entrance to the printing press room. Then, Sly, you jump in, grab the clockwork tail feathers, and we all get the heck out of here. I honestly don't have a lot to say about these little Bentley slideshows, except that they're apparently called Jock Talks, so yeah, I'm never calling them slideshows again. Alright, Murray, sick em. Jump into my arms! I'll toss you up there! Okay, I swear this throw is incredibly easy almost every time I play this game, but once in a blue moon it takes me like 20 tries and I have no clue why. Just freaking get up there! Ooh, scary looking puzzle. It'd be a shame if the solution was just to press every switch one time. Success! Sly, the water pressure to the fountain should be disabled. It's off all right. They're already sending out the repair guy to fix it up. Pickpocket the keys to his repair truck without being seen. All right, this is where it all comes together. The goal when designing these levels was to recreate the feeling of a Hollywood heist movie. The reconnaissance, the setup, the pieces falling into place, and then the heist itself going off without a hitch. The feeling of not just being one thief, but a, well, one of those. It pulls this off with varying degrees of success with each mission. I think in general you get a lot more brawling and laying the smack down on guards in this game than any heist movie I've ever seen. But that's really just a consequence of the medium. In the grand scheme of things, this really sticks to the landing. Take the wheel. I know how to drive a stick shift. I'm in position. Great. We're just driving up right now. Get ready to grab the tow harpoon. Hooks on. Pull away. Behold the majesty of gravity and inertia. That was real subtle, Bentley. Okay. You jump in, grab the clockwork tail feathers, and we're out of here! God! So raccoonas do this! 
right early bumming my house up and bringing me down. So very uncool. Why can't you let birds and bees be free, bro? Listen, Dimitri. You have no idea what you're playing with. It'll bring more than your house down. Look, bro. I see you are a tough cowboy. A man with taste, style, vision, a connoisseur of finer things. Like me. Look, I'm sure that two cats in a bag like us can work something out. Yeah? We smooth. Look, see the money. You like the money. You can take all you want. I can't. No deal. You and the rest of the claw gang have to be stopped. Clockwork will never again see the light of day. Just hand over the tail feathers and we can... What is this with clocks, bro? Have you no vision? Are you hearing what I mean to you? You think you have juice? Don't show me a little mind when talking about such big things. You think you can swing the bat? Show your bling and let me shine you. I have no idea what you're saying. And your suit sucks. Oh, let's dance! Now, we've got a boss fight with Dimitri. Here he comes. Mechanically, this is pretty simple. He'll fire his ring at you three times before it shorts out and you can close the distance. Then it's close quarters combat until you hit him enough times to make him retreat. He only uses two attacks, this uppercut and this tail sweep. You can avoid both by jumping away to the side every time you see him wind up. But now we got that over with, I think this is the most interesting room in terms of alpha content. In the final game, you've got these elevators that don't do anything, but in the alpha you could ride them up to the upper levels, and Dimitri would actually chase you between them. With some clever platforming, you can reach these upper areas in the final game, and see that everything up here is still interactable, including this second set of elevators. We can only speculate what all this was for, but you've gotta imagine the boss fight was originally going to function a bit like mugshots from the first game, building tension from level to level as you steadily get less safe ground and cover to work with. Presumably, it may also have paid off the Chekhov's gun that is this don't blow up the generator sign, with the area getting steadily more destroyed as the fight went on, forcing the to upper levels as the first floor flooded with water, or something. I don't know. I wasn't in the room where it happened. You take clockwork feathers and my counterfeit in operation. It's past tense. I'm doing you a favor. What kind of thief prints money? There's no honor in that. You. <laughs> Crack-a-box! <laughs> My gang and I had done it. The clockwork tail feathers were ours, and Dimitri's counterfeiting operation was ruined. To the untimely arrival of Carmelita, my escape got a little tricky. Angry at having just missed me, she took it out on Dimitri. Shutting down the nightclub. Alright, I don't want to be that guy, but, um, uh, yeah. Shutting down the nightclub and throwing the frustrated forger behind bars. I gotta say, it seems like the cops really show up apropos of nothing here, don't they? Like, if they could've just busted in here to take down the operation at any time, why didn't they do it sooner? Mila obviously already had the intel necessary to blow the whistle on him, so what was accomplished by her helping us? I'm pretty sure the only difference is that we now have the tail feathers instead of the police. Interesting. The gang and I headed out of town for a week in Monaco. I figured the team had earned themselves a well-deserved break. Oh, hang on. That's not where the cutscene ends. Uh, play it again. Team had earned themselves a well-deserved break. Nope. Yep. Okay. It just stops there. What's going on here? Okay. So, slight tangent. There's an organization called Peggy, and Peggy's job is to regulate the age ratings for games released in Europe like the ESRB does in the West. Ever since their inception in 2003, things have become steadily more strict, especially in terms of gambling. If you're familiar with the Pokemon series, you probably already know this, but these days, if a game contains any, uh, glamorization of gambling, then that game's for adults only. I tell you this because, as far as I'm aware, this scene was present in its entirety in every release of the PS2 version, and the part that got so clumsily sliced off in 
the PS3 version is about gambling. And some sort of adherence to the international age rating is the best faith motivation I can think of for why that decision was made. There's just one tiny little wrinkle. I am not playing the international release of this game. This is the case in all versions of the PS3 Sly Collection, but listen here you bunch of baboons. Peggy makes considerations for remakes and re-releases, and unless actual changes to the content are made, they retain the age rating of the original release. Or maybe you could have only made changes to the version set to release where there are actual age restrictions in place, or were you just too busy looking for more corners to cut? And, AND, you didn't change the casino level in the first game! So whatever this was meant to accomplish, I'm pretty sure you didn't do it! Look, I know I said I wasn't gonna bring this up again, but this isn't just some lack of visual polish. This is a chunk of one of the game's cutscenes, which I emphasize are some of the best parts of this game, and losing even a second of them is a big issue, so pardon me while I fix your mistake. The gang and I headed out of town for a week in Monaco. Bentley wanted to try out his new card counting formula, and I figured the team had earned themselves a well-deserved break. There, that was it. Nothing major, but it's the principle of the thing. Anyway, that was the Black Chateau. I love it. Honestly, it's probably my third or fourth favorite level in the whole series. Paris is such a natural fit for Sly, their harmony further illustrated by the similar palettes, literally helping Sly blend right in. The overall level is designed to put you at your ease, with long stretches of conjoining rooftops that ensure you pretty much never have to touch down on the streets if you don't want to. The missions are almost all tutorials for some mechanic or another, navigation, stealth, chasing girls, but they're all crucial skills in the game ahead, and they all feel totally organic within the structure of the heist. Except maybe the pickpocketing one, cause like, there weren't even spotlights in the printing room and what's up with designing the keys to be fragile. I can think of at least one reason that'd be a terrible idea. <laughs> Overall, though, we're still at a super strong showing. Dimitri's a joy to have on screen, and though Carmelita's absence is certainly felt, Neela serves as an exciting and flirtatious presence in her stead. With one unqualified success under our belt, I can't wait to take on our next chapter, a starry-eyed encounter. See you then. Thank <laughs> you.